In the east of the known world is a land that emerged from its colonial Thiatian and Alphatian overseers to become a country of fierce warriors and deep philosophy. To the unschooled, this confederacy of six emirates has the potential to be easily divided. However, the emirates of Ilarum is bound together by the eternal truth, as revealed by its historic leader, Suleiman al-Khalim, in the form of philosophical dreams documented together with his heroic exploits in a holy book known as the Nahmeh. The Emirates of Ilarum is a place of tradition, honour and faith. Hi, I'm Bekmi Berserker and welcome back to my channel. It's time to explore the second of the gazetteers that supported the known world, the Bekmi Dungeons and Dragons campaign world. Today we'll be looking at Gaz 2, the Emirates of Ilarum, a very different land to the last gazetteer we reviewed, with a very different culture. If you're new here, then welcome. This is where we explore the Beckme edition of Dungeons and Dragons, released between 1983 and 1986, in five boxed sets, and also as an amalgamated rulebook called The Rules Cyclopedia in 1991. If you want to know more about Beckme, then please follow the link on the screen to my Beckme playlist. Before I begin, I thought I would start this video with a quick acknowledgement that the detail within this gazetteer has obvious parallels with Islamic and Arabic culture, to the point that the history of Ilarum has a figurehead that is revered, and whose revelations and activities resulted in their documentation in a holy book, which is the basis of how those who live in the Emirates conduct their lives. There is reference in this gazetteer to true believers, non-believers, worshipping and crusading. Clearly, the production team lent heavily on actual Islamic customs and history, but it's also clear, as you will see, that this work remained in the realm of fantasy. That's what this book is, a work of fantasy informed by a specific human culture. The reason I am stating this clearly is to ensure that this is understood. I may have to repeat myself as I focus in on a specific area, but I thought it worth stating this from the outset of the review. So, with that out of the way, Gaz 2, The Emirates of Ilarum, was written by Ken Rolston and published by TSR in 1987. It was a softcover book and had 64 pages, and was accompanied by an A1-sized colour map of the Emirates and some of its major locations. Like its previous gazetteer, the cover separated from the main book and had three panels with more maps. So it seemed that this feature, combined with the A1 map, was to become a theme of the gazetteers going forward, so something to look forward to in future publications. One thing I have to mention is the cover art, which is something I neglected to focus on with my review of Gaz 1, the Grand Duchy of Karamekos. The cover art by Clyde Caldwell is incredible and evocative of the kind of environment you are about to dive into. There is no mistaking the cultural references and the use of burnt orange and sandy browns almost make you feel the heat of the desert coming right through the cover. It really is beautiful. Turning back to the A1 table map, it included a closer look at the city of Ilarum and the two coastal cities of Suraman Ra and Taramonikas, whilst also including a map suggesting the layout of a typical town and a specific village called Kirkuk, which we will examine in closer detail later. The three-panel book cover contained illustrations of the Caliph's Palace and a location called the Dream of the Desert Garden University, and also a player's map detailing the Emirates' location in relation to neighbouring countries. Most intriguing is a large underground map called Barrymore's Underground Complex, suggesting information was to be found inside the gazetteer about this place. The contents of the book were separated into numerous parts but to me appeared to be defined in three separate sections. There was what I will refer to as the lay of the land, which was really the core detail of the setting, and comprised of the history of the Emirates, its geography and ecology, information about the people who lived there, the country's economy and how society works. Then there was a pull-out section that could be handed to the players, giving them specific information that they might know, whilst keeping them away from DM-only information. I just want to mention a couple of things about this. First, this is a clear demonstration of how older editions of D&D focus their marketing on dungeon masters rather than players. Secondly, who on earth actually pulled out these sections? 
I mean, there was no way I was going to defile my beautiful book and allow my players to get their muddy paws on it. I mean, I love my players, but not that much. Anyway, what I'll refer to as the final adventuring section contains an adventure location, the village of Kirkuk, and information on further campaigning in Ilarum. Although my first impression of the book is that it is good value for money, especially considering the cover art, a quick leaf through it causes me to have some reservations. It's clear there is a lot of content, following the text-heavy approach similar to Gaz 1. However, I'm noticing some omissions compared to that book. Will it matter? Like I said, this is a first impression, so let's see how I feel at the end. That said, Gaz 2 does come with a full-colour A1 table size map, utilising the familiar hex format and terrain symbols common to what we saw with Gaz 1, the Grand Duchy of Karamekos. So again, I would feel confident this is going to be the format as we move forward through the Gazetteers. However, the map suffers from some poor contrasting of text against the background, which was the same as with Gaz 1, but additionally, this map has numerous other, more significant faults with it. First, it has no scale. I've looked everywhere on my copy, and a scale is nowhere to be found on the entire map of the Emirates. Scales are only found on the smaller maps of the towns. I had to go back to Gaz 1's map of Kalamakos to find out what the scale was there, which is 8 miles to 1 hex, and then cross-reference that map with the map of the Emirates to ensure the scale matched and it did. So the scale of this map is 8 miles to 1 hex, but this is not mentioned anywhere in the Gazetteer, as far as I can tell. I think you would agree this is a fundamental flaw when it comes to maps. Secondly, throughout the Gazetteer there are numerous references to a place in the Emirates called the oost Earth Valley. A quick check of the map shows there is no labelling of this place at all. It can be determined from the descriptions in the Gazetteer, but only after searching the text for it, which is a nuisance. Thirdly, the naming of the sea off the east coast of the map is the Sea of Dread, but when comparing this to the player's map and the textual description of the land, this should say the Sea of Dawn. The Sea of Dread is on the south coast of the continent, so this is a mistake. This editing error, as well as the lack of scale and the omission of labelling the oost Ert Valley where it should be, are big fails in my opinion. A dungeon master wants to be certain that what they're reading and what they're seeing on the map match up, but this causes extra work and ambiguity. Indeed, if I didn't have another gazetteer, I'm not sure how I'd know what the scale of this map was, and I'd have this lingering sense of disappointment whenever referring to this map because, well, it's not as good as it could have been. Okay, so not a great start, but let's keep exploring the Emirates of Ilarum. What kind of place is it? Who are its people? And how are they joined together through the teachings of Suleiman al Kalim? Well, without giving too many spoilers away, the land that is now known as the Emirates of Ilarum was once home to the centre of the Nithian Empire. I could divulge more information about this empire and the events that led to its downfall, but I'll leave that to aspiring dungeon masters wanting to reveal this land to their players. The Nithian Empire mysteriously collapsed 1500 years ago, leaving behind no clue as to the reason for this event. However, the aftermath of this event was a huge change in the geography and climate of the region, turning it into a desert wasteland, referred to as the Alassian Basin. In fact, many geologists believe that sometime in the future, if the climate becomes wetter, the Emirates will be an inland sea. But this is obviously not currently the case. The Alassian Basin remains a harsh environment, compounded by it being so close to sea level and retaining much of its heat. Over the following centuries, as the surviving indigenous Nithians declined, they were supplanted by the Alassians, a people whose origin is disputed, but who themselves believe always lived in the area. The Alassians believe they rose to ascendancy through the development of agricultural coastal settlements and desert oases. Close to around the same time, about 100 AC, a people called the Makistani emigrated south from lands now known as the Ethangar Khanate to occupy a fertile region west of the Alassian Basin called the Ustert Valley. The Makistani consolidated the area and lived an isolated existence for some time. It wasn't long before both Thiatian and Alphatian colonies sought to exploit the region vacated by the Nithians, mostly along the coastal and southern borders. After a few centuries, this resulted in intermittent warfare between the two empires, 
but on a small colonial scale, which caused the Alassians to be driven further and further into the Alassian Basin, albeit split into their separate tribes. The result of the warfare between Thiatian and Alphatian was a decline in colonial power on both sides, as each one struggled for superiority over a period of 300 years. The coming together of the Emirates really began with the birth of Suleiman al khalim in 800 AC. By all accounts a paragon of men, al khalim sought to unite the region and force out both the Thiatians and the Alphatians. At the age of 25 he captured a small village in the centre of the Alassian Basin called Ilarum and established it as his tribal seat. al khalim then used his uncanny charisma to unite numerous tribes, including the Makistani in the west, and swept all enemies before him with his superior military knowledge, utilising the Makistani steppe tactics and also mounted spellcasting tactics learned from his encounters with the Alphatians. But what united the people of the desert most were the spiritual revelations that Suleiman al khalim had in the form of dreams, to bring the tribal chiefs and their people together under one belief system, under which they could all live in cooperation and fraternity. This shared belief, called the Eternal Truth, is what brought al khalim victory over the imperial colonists. In 831 AC, Suleiman al khalim sat with his victorious chiefs and sheikhs at what is referred to as the first convocation of tribes, where he was declared as their sultan, or chief of chiefs. This enabled him to obtain their signatures and vows to establish the confederated tribes of the Emirates of Ilarum, or what is commonly referred to amongst the population as just the Emirates. Only foreigners continue to call it the Emirates of Ilarum. Once this occurred, Suleiman al khalim made the decision to withdraw from public life where it is said he entered a period of pilgrimage, travelling to a place called the Undersea Kingdom, to seek an immortal to sponsor himself and his people. Power was devolved to a council of wise men called the Preceptors, which has remained faithful to the teachings of al khalim ever since. Suleiman is thought to have lived a long life, dying at around 900 AC, but not before his faithful companion, Farid, had documented his dreams, philosophies and exploits into the eternal truth of al khalim the book known to everyone in the Emirates as the Nahmeh. Today it is 1000 AC and the preceptors still rule according to the eternal truth from what has now become the city of Ilarum. In fact, the years have caused the eternal truth to become ingrained into the way of life of the Emirates citizens, commonly called the Ilari, so much so that it would be unthinkable to live any other way. So after that quick historical summary, let's dive into the lay of the land. The Gazetteer presents the Emirates through descriptions of its geology and topography, its climate and terrain, and its native flora and fauna. As I mentioned earlier, the Emirates is made up largely of the Alassian Basin, described as a great scoop open to the eastern sea, rising towards the coast before plummeting again towards sea level in the last few miles. Most of the rainfall that occurs in the Emirates drains into vast underground reservoirs. However, the Oost Ert Valley in the west of the country, which is occupied by the Makistani, is a fertile land that has enough water to sustain its settlements, fed by seasonal rivers known as Wadi, that wind down from the mountains into the valley and bring fresh water in the winter and spring, and dry up over the summer to early autumn. The Emirates is mostly made up of desert, with many parts receiving little to no rain all year. Temperatures in these regions range from 50 to well over 100 Fahrenheit, with potential drops overnight by as much as 20 Fahrenheit, sometimes meaning freezing temperatures. Your characters better be prepared for multiple extremes. With such a dry environment, the most hazardous weather comes in the form of sandstorms, which have been known to decimate travellers and last for days. Even if shelter is found, the screaming wind is known to have sent many a traveller mad. Still, for such a harsh environment, there exist small communities that have adhered to the visions of al khalim and found enough water to sustain themselves and grow food. In fact, the skilled diviner may find water surprisingly closer than one might think. The highlands that surround the northern, western and southern borders of the Emirates have a wetter climate, although their wadi still dry up in the summer and early autumn. Temperatures are a little cooler than that of the Alassian Basin, but not by enough to be comfortable for the average visitor. 
The eastern coastal plain of the Emirates is a strip of land one to five miles wide, depending on where you are along it, which extends from the southern Thaiatian territory of Telakbir to beyond Suraman Ra in the north. To its west is an escarpment that can be anything from 200 to 500 feet high. The land here receives enough rain for significant and prosperous agriculture, and temperatures are relatively mild and comfortable, being on average between 50 and 80 Fahrenheit. Now, I know this is starting to sound like a weather report or geography lesson, but why this is all important is to set the scene for the environment your character will be travelling in. In my opinion, it's unlikely that many D&D players, especially at the time of this gazetteer's release, will have significant experience of living in a desert. And without that knowledge, it's easy to take environmental hazards for granted. The Emirates is among the harshest environments your characters will ever face, Ignoring these facts or simply brushing them aside will lessen the overall experience, in my opinion. Embracing them prepares you for the harshest of contests, that with Mother Nature herself. The introduction to the Emirates environment concludes with descriptions of the types of plants and animals that live there. Again, this is extremely useful to a dungeon master unfamiliar to this climate that is trying to build an immersive world for their players' imaginations. Within this section, there is also contextualization of the behaviours of some creatures that you might want to use, such as how baboons might raid local croplands. I can just imagine low-level characters being asked by a desperate farmer to move on a bunch of baboons, only to find that the baboons have been moved into your territory by something else. Little tidbits such as sightings of blue dragons or the occasional giant rock are given, which might stimulate a dungeon master's imagination when adding flavour to scenes. The next couple of pages are dedicated to describing the Ilari as things stand in 1000 AC, to introduce us to the dominant ethnicities that live in the region, but also to get us thinking about the background of the characters you might want to play. These ethnicities are the Makastani, Thaiatian, Alphatian, Alassian and Nithian. Yes, I did say Nithian. Each group has distinct physical characteristics, and some information is given about their way of life but it is generally assumed that each group has been absorbed into Alassian culture, as believers of Al-Khalim's eternal truth, so the differences tend to be more physical than cultural, except for the Makistani, who still hold on to many of their northern steppe traditions. I should pause here and explain the presence of the Nithians. We are told in the Gazetteer that after the fall of the Nithian Empire, many descendants were absorbed into Alassian culture, but some pure Nithians do still survive in what's described as high arid wastes. But they are seldom seen, and Al-Khalim's eternal truth forbids interacting with them, as they are thought to be an evil people. Maybe your characters might travel there to find out. Each section on these peoples is accompanied by text labelled Staging, which suggests way for integrating them into your campaign. These are fun prompts to get you thinking, which may or may not be ignored in getting a player started in the Emirates. It's worth mentioning here that there is no reference to the demi-human races when referring to the people of the Emirates. They do get a mention later when referring to international relations, but for now it's worth stating that elves are extremely rare in the Emirates, and treated with much suspicion of practising dark arts, although there is no mention of why. Halflings are not treated very seriously, marginalised as cute and childlike, and very good at telling stories. Dwarves are the most respected of demi-humans due to their engineering prowess and general trustworthiness. Out of all the demi-humans, the dwarves are the most likely to be found in the Emirates, although still on a very small scale. But clearly, the people of the Emirates need to get out more. After this quick overview of the people that make up the Ilari, we are introduced to the six Emirates themselves, and how the economy of the country works in terms of its currency and taxation. The six emirates are Alassia, the largest and dominant region occupying the centre of the country, and home to the capital of Ilarum and served by numerous tribal seats. There's Abashan in the east of the country, its capital of the same name occupying an oasis far from its coastal trading ports of Jabur and Fabia. There's Nithia, comprising mostly of the inhospitable northern highlands, rich in precious ore, flanked by its coastal capital of Suraman Ra, and Chinsamenu, that sits on the caravan route near the northern border. There's Makistan, which sits in the west of the country, occupying the Oost Ert Valley and overseeing the fertile breadbasket of the land from its modest city of Parsa. 
There's Nicostinia in the southeast, the most cosmopolitan of the Emirates, with its bustling trading capital of Daramonicas, and the port of Gubia further up the coast. And last but not least, there is Dithestinia in the south, mostly made up of the southern highlands containing rich ores, with its capital of Chitiesiphon straddling a fork in the caravan route towards the south and the east. Within the descriptions of these areas, we are treated to in-depth information about their various economies, such as what products they grow or make, and what they trade in, as well as some local cultural references. This actually turns out to be quite a list, giving an excellent picture of the type of products that might be available to characters. This also works as great scene setters for distinguishing one region from another, so that dungeon masters can make settings feel different from one another whilst still in the same country, purely by describing what's for sale in the marketplace and how people are interacting. In terms of the local currency, we are told that one gold piece is referred to as a dinar, one silver piece is called a dirham, and one copper piece is called a fal. We are also told that platinum and electrum coins are not minted in the Emirates due to a lack of those metals. Probably the most intriguing of the information on taxation is that foreigners and unbelievers must pay a poll tax of 10 dinar a month, but this also excludes them from military duties and public service. So here we are presented quite clearly with different treatment between those who believe in the eternal truth and those who don't. Although we are told throughout the book that the Emirates is, in most regions, tolerant of foreigners. I'm sure that tolerance is related to being able to tax unbelievers an extra 10 dinar a month. Anyway, what is clearly absent from this section on the six emirates are the names of any NPC rulers or emirs. There's no indication of who's in charge in these areas or if any of them have any particular political intrigue or interregional conflict. The descriptions are functional enough, but not really inspiring. And I came away from reading this section without forming any particular ideas in my head, apart from perhaps the potential to explore the ancient region of Nithia, purely because of the potential to reveal lost secrets of an ancient empire. That area has a lot going for it, in my opinion. After this short introduction into the six emirate regions, we are given 15 pages devoted to how society works in the country. That might seem a lot, but the reason for this is that emirate society is completely interlinked with the eternal truth, as revealed by Suleiman al-Khalim, and because of this it becomes necessary to understand the religion and how it works. First we are given background information on who Suleiman al-Khalim was, and how he endeavoured to remove Thiasian and Alphatian colonists from the land, including intriguing tidbits that help explain why he was so successful. In addition, we are given some detail on what's referred to as dynasties of Al-Khalim, which are basically two factions that claim to descend from him. These are the Preceptors, which I've mentioned before, and the Kin. The Preceptors, or teachers of the moral truth, claim they are descended through the line of wise men Al-Khalim chose to succeed him as I mentioned earlier. The Kin claim to be actual descendants of Al-Khalim and claim Abashan as their cultural centre. The book states that the preceptors favour modern and cosmopolitan values whilst tolerating foreigners and unbelievers. The Kin are far more conservative, treating foreigners and unbelievers with hostility. It might cost you more than 10 dinar a month to live under that regime. The text suggests that over the course of a campaign, Control of the emirates may swing between preceptors and kin, depending on how a dungeon master would want to run their campaign. I think this is the kind of political infighting I was looking for in the descriptions of the six emirates, and it can also be used as a backdrop to how welcome characters travelling to the emirates truly are. A dungeon master can set the scene by choosing which faction is in control, and go from there. I can really visualise those early weeks of the kin gaining control from the preceptors, and the jeopardy that would put foreigners under truly terrifying, and potentially a great backdrop for adventures centred on getting personalities out of the region, such as rich ambassadors and diplomats, who could end up owing characters more than their lives. Ok, so we got some idea of who Al-Khalim was, and who oversees the application of the Eternal Truth, or their version of it. But what is the Eternal Truth? What actually makes up this faith? Well, the section on society goes into this in more depth. But essentially, we are told that the eternal truth of Al-Khalim, as documented in the Nahmeh and accepted by all true believers, is that a man must have faith and trust in the immortal guardians, the honour of his fellow man, and the wisdom that is obtained through reason and contemplation. The Nahmeh 
directs men on the proper ways to show respect and honour to the immortal guardians and to other men, and praises those who seek to understand the world around them through scholarship and study. What I'm really conscious of, as I read this text, is the laboured use of the word man or men, which gave me pause and caused me to scan the entire gazetteer for the words woman or women, as I'm increasingly conscious of their omission. The result of this was eight mentions of the word woman and four mentions of the word women in the entire 64 pages. But these mentions related only to adventure suggestions later in the book, or descriptions of how certain tribes are made up. There is no mention of women at all in how society works, not even what their contribution is. Even the real-life culture this society is based on has that. You could argue that this omission is perhaps because there is no difference between men and women in the Emirates, but that's not the sense I'm getting from the text. The preceptors are made up of wise men. Prayer leaders are referred to as learned and devout men. The absence of women in the culture is obvious, particularly with no mention of any female NPCs. And this is a glaring omission in my opinion, especially given that characters travelling to the region may be of either gender, and a dungeon master might want some clue or direction in terms of how adventuring females might be perceived, if at all differently. If you're familiar with adventuring in the Emirates of Ilarun, what do you think? Did you come across this when you played in the region, or am I just overthinking things? Okay, so I digressed a little. Let's dive into the eternal truth and its articles of faith, and convert you all to true believers. Or at least make you a little more familiar with the faith of the people of the Emirates. We are told that the Nahmeh details certain rituals that relate to the observation of the eternal truth. These are referred to within three reverences. In reverencing the immortal guardians, we have two rituals. First, all true believers must pray at sunrise and sunset. And second, all true believers must fast for 24 hours from sunset to sunset on the day of the full moon. On breaking this fast, which is usually accompanied by feasting, it is symbolic to share your feast with the poor. In reverencing one's fellow man, there are three rituals. First, when meeting other true believers, one must observe the water ritual, which can be the literal sharing of water between each other, a wet handshake, no comment, or an elaborate tea or coffee ceremony, depending on your circumstances. Secondly, there is the truth-telling, an extremely powerful observation, which is that one must not speak a lie to another true believer. As a result, the Ilari have become quite adept at spinning the truth. Thirdly, is attendance to the security of your fellow man, which basically means giving alms to the poor, and answering any summons to war against unbelievers. True believers are not supposed to attack each other. In reverencing wisdom and scholarship, there are two rituals. The first is judgment, which is, in judging all issues, a true believer should contemplate and observe, weigh the evidence, and use knowledge over tradition and superstition. A good framing of the scientific method, I think. The second is the reading, reciting and study of the Nahmeh. It is expected that all true believers, whatever section of society they come from, are able to do this. In addition to these reverences, true believers are encouraged to carry out pilgrimage in symbolic reference to al Khalim's journey to the Undersea Kingdom. In lieu of being able to access this mysterious location, this pilgrimage usually ends up being a trip to the city of Ilarum, to one of the centres of learning, for lectures and talks in the eternal truth, but this isn't obligatory. The articles of faith are what underpin the eternal truth, revealed to al Khalim during the time of unifying the Emirates. The first of these is the dream of justice and honour, which prevents true believers from taking up arms against each other, so as to face threats from unbelievers together. The second is the dream of the garden in the desert, which obliges chiefs and those in power to study how water may be obtained and distributed to all members of society and to manage their water supplies effectively. This has resulted in true believers living in the most inhospitable of places. Beneath all this are what are called the three ways of al Khalim, which are essentially how true believers put their faith into practice. First, there is the way of the follower, which is really how most of society practices their faith, the default true believer, if you will. Then there is the way of the warrior, made up of several military orders which I have listed here, along with their function. And finally, we have the way of the scholar, which might be equivalent to a priesthood, 
but the eternal truth has no church or hierarchy to speak of. The way of the scholar is made up of prayer leaders, itinerants, which are what would be cleric adventurers, and dervishes, which are holy hermits, kind of like a desert druid. We'll have a closer look at them when we get to the players section. The book states that clerics of the way of the scholar gain access to new spells, which I have listed here. These are not in addition to normal clerical spells, but replace certain ones. There are not many, but there is at least some attempt here to attune the clerical spell lists to the land and culture of the Emirates. Clearly, the practices of the eternal truth reflect Islamic culture, whilst obviously having differences. In fact, I've listed here the five pillars of Islam against the three reverences and their rituals, so that you can see the parallels. I think this was done to cultivate a desert culture that was recognisable, whilst transferring it to a fantasy setting. Ultimately, I think the articulation of the eternal truth and its articles of faith succeeds in building an alternative fantasy religion that echoes a real-world one without demeaning it or being disparaging. In fact, given that most D&D games default to a Western or Eurocentric practicing of faith, if D&D was invented in the Middle East, it begs the question whether it would have looked like this. You have to wonder. It would be great to get comments from any viewers of Middle Eastern descent or any Muslim players out there to get their opinion about this setting. I think it would be really interesting to hear them. What's clear when going through the remaining pages on society in the Emirates is how much the eternal truth underpins the fabric of the country. Every aspect of life is rooted in the religion, from personal obligations to laws and customs, and how the transgressing of laws is punished. It all comes back to the eternal truth and the teachings of Al-Khalim. A couple of really interesting customs jumped out at me. The first was that magic users, which are called sorcerers in the Emirates, must identify themselves by wearing distinctive colourful robes inscribed with the words, practising sorcerer. Failure to do so could mean exile or imprisonment. However, the custom I found really interesting was on the subject of slavery. We are told that slavery is illegal in the Emirates, except for the crime of unlawful debt. In other words, indebted servitude is common and can run for periods of one to five years. We are told that about 2% of the population of cities are legal slaves, meaning indebted. So the city of Ilarum, with its population of 20,000 people, would have approximately 400 slaves, all legal and above board. Strangely, we are told that slaves have the same civil rights as servants, except that they do not have a choice of who they work for or what they do. I've tossed this statement around my head and I'm still not sure how that would work. Anyway, apparently there is the right kind of slavery and the wrong kind of slavery, because slavery is illegal, except for the legal kind. Just don't owe anyone any money in the Emirates and you should be okay. Anyway, before we move on to the player section, we're treated to a few informative pages about how the Emirates is ruled by its Sultan, Grand Vizier, Viziers and Emirs. This is an excellent bit of setup that gets the imagination going in terms of how characters might interact with rulers of the land at different levels, including some of the unscrupulous behaviours that Viziers might exhibit to get things done, all within the allowances of the eternal truth, of course, at least as far as it can be stretched. The one disappointment I have here is the lack of NPCs. For instance, we're never given a name for the Sultan or Grand Vizier. Given that all Gazetteers default to the same moment in time, that being 1000 AC, this is surely a constant that should have merited the naming of key living figures. However, we are introduced to the ranking of hereditary nobility, which you can see here and how it links to the noble titles as presented in the Beckme Companion rules. We are treated to some suggestions on how characters might be offered the opportunity to obtain land and titles in the Emirates, most of which are very risky and tied to many obligations which, of course, would be called in at a time of least convenience. Still, it's interesting to see the crossover here and the suggestion of how to implement the Dominion rules in the companion set within the Emirates of Ilarum. Well, we're only now just coming to the end of what I called the lay of the land section, but the reason for digging so deep into this is really because of the need to understand the culture of the Emirates to really get it. I think immersion is key to a successful campaign here, and there's a lot of information to dive into. A good dungeon master can tie his players up in knots, in a good way, and watch them try to navigate customs that might be alien to them if they are foreigners, or familiar to them, and need navigating to ensure they remain within the requirements of the eternal truth. It's obvious that a lot of fun can be had with this setting. So let's dive into the player's pullout section which is printed on paper of a desert yellow colour, perhaps to evoke some kind of reference to the campaign setting, but
but otherwise works as a way of visually separating DM information from the players. This pullout section, which I will never pull out, consists of only eight pages, but there's a lot to focus in on here. The first couple of pages center on what players might know about the emeralds, depending on where they have come from and who they have been talking to. This information is broken down into six distinct areas of knowledge that could either help or hinder a character's interaction with the Ilari. These areas are what's known about the people, what's known about the land, the city of Ilarum, other towns in the Emirates, how to get rich and famous, and hot tips. Clearly there is room for much embellishment here, but this is a really good primer for players new to the Emirates, which also enables DMs to set the scene as necessary. Next, we are presented with information on how to create an Illyri character, which essentially offers suggestions for naming your character and learning where they hail from, be it a tribe or a settlement. In addition, we are presented with a choice of cultural backgrounds and spiritualism, which offers an Ilari spin to alignment. We are also offered a good number of suggestions for physical appearance and distinctive habits or actions. And finally, we are even offered some Ilari nickname suggestions, which might help to round off your character's personality a little better. Examining this information more closely, it's clear that the list of suggested names are actually real-world Arabic stroke Islamic names. Perhaps it was too risky for TSR to suggest Arabic-sounding fantasy names without a deeper knowledge of the language available, although that's just my guess. Also, this list contains female names, which suggests female Ilari characters may be found as frequently as male. Although mercifully welcome, this information is out of step with the way the Emirates is otherwise presented throughout the book, with its lack of female characters anywhere, as I spoke about earlier. Anyway, this list would be the equivalent of using a list of Christian names. Obviously, not a problem if the names are exotic to you, but maybe not too exciting for players who are more than familiar with Arabic names. Examining the Ilari tribe chart, and this is actually a list of real-world Arabic tribes, so maybe this list would be inspirational to people who are unaware of this, but as someone who is, I thought this was a bit of a cop-out. Again, it might come down to TSR not having the available knowledge of Arabic to make up words in another language, but this tribal list is again equivalent to just listing a bunch of Celtic or Native American tribe names. You might be okay with that, but if I'm exploring a fantasy setting, I'd expect to get fantasy tribes. Perhaps I'm being too harsh. You tell me. In developing your Illyri character, we are introduced to two new skills, those of riding and storytelling. The Illyri take great pride in their riding skill, and because of this, may be able to conduct difficult tasks in the saddle, like casting spells. Storytelling is of great value in the Emirates, and high quality stories may reap high rewards. A character exceeding their storytelling check might be showered with expensive gifts. When developing an Ilari character, both a riding rating and a storyteller rating are added to the character sheet. I love this mechanic, it really sets an Ilari apart from other cultures. Sure, a Karamikan fighter might be able to spin a yarn to a local Gadi, but an Ilari might be able to get the Gadi to pay for their room and board, and then some, just because they could tell a good tale. So, given the information on creating an Ilari character, and the information about riding and storytelling checks, let's go ahead and generate one. Here we have a Bekmi character sheet for a typical fighter, so let's make them an Ilari. First, let's select a name from the list. We actually need two names, as Ilari tend to state their name and who they are the offspring of. For example, we are shown that Urabi ibn Salim would be Urabi son of Salim. Now, I like randomization, so I'm going to roll for my name. I was mad enough to count these names, the things I do for you, and counted 97. So I'm going to roll deep percentile and ignore everything over 97. Let's do this. 30 and 42. Counting across these names again, I find that my character is called Fatima, a woman. It is written. And that her father was called Ismail. What's really interesting here is that Ibn actually means son of in Arabic, rather than offspring of. So we can either say that Ibn is the universal term in the Emirates for game purposes, or we can continue in the vein of the Arabic influence in these provided names and tribes and use the word bint, which means daughter of. I'm going to use the word bint, if only to point out another omission of the requirement for Ilari female characters. Great, so my character is now called Fatima bint Ismail. Right, now I must determine whether my character is a nomad for determining their tribe or a Hazara. 
which is the name for one who lives in a settlement or a specific region. So if I roll odd, Fatima is a nomad, and if I roll even, she is a Hazar. 9. Fatima bint Ismail is a nomad. So just give me a minute whilst I count the number of these tribes. 61. OK, so let's do this with a d6 for the tens and a d10 for the units. 21. So that makes Fatima bint Ismail of the Dayan tribe. Being a nomad, I can place her anywhere the game requires of me, so that could make my introduction to the game a little easier. But what's Fatima's cultural background? Is she a Lassiani? Makistani? Let's find out. We have six choices here on the list, with the other D&D nationality presumably offering the opportunity to fit in perhaps a foreign character that was adopted or rescued at a young age and brought up as an Alari in the ways of the eternal truth. Perhaps even a demi-human. That's how I'd interpret it anyway. So let's roll a d6. 4. Thiatian. Ooh, interesting. I have a background building in my head already. I'm not going to roll for spirituality as I'm going to stick with the suggested lawful for followers of the eternal truth, and it fits better with the background I'm conceiving. And also, reading through the physical hooks and gestures, they are slanted towards male characters, so I won't roll randomly in them. But I will pick a couple of things out. Let's say, many rings on her fingers, and always choose her lip. As for a nickname, let's go for Goldfingers. This is shaping up really well. Okay, so just a couple more things. The riding and storyteller ratings. We are told that the riding rating is determined by applying the following bonuses and penalties to a character's dexterity score. These modifiers are cumulative, so we need to go through all of them. Right, Fatima is not a dwarf or a halfling, but she is level 1, so she has a minus 1 straight away. She has no military cavalry training, but she is a nomad, so she was born in the saddle, giving her a plus 2, and a cumulative plus 1. So Fatima's rider rating is her dexterity, which is 12, plus 1, making a grand total of 13. The rules state that a riding check is conducted by rolling 3d6 to roll the rider rating or less to succeed at a difficult task. This is slightly different from typical skill checks in Beckme, which are done on a d20, but I would be tempted to say that this particular 3d6 check is specific to Illery riding checks, thereby demonstrating a clear separation between Illery characters and others. Ok, so now for the storytelling rating. We are told that this is obtained by adding together a character's intelligence, wisdom and charisma scores, and their character level. So for Fatima, this is 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 1, equaling 28. A rather poor score, but maybe after some adventures her tales will be full of wonder. The rules state that to make a storytelling check, a character must roll 3d6 and add their storyteller rating, plus any modifiers determined by the Dungeon Master, as shown in this table. Clearly you can see from the potential results that this is a difficult check for low level characters to succeed at, but it might come in useful at some time, and hopefully Fatima has a long life of adventure ahead of her. So I'm going to say that Fatima bint Ismail comes from a line of Thiatian colonists that settled around Daramanikas centuries ago. As Suleiman al Khalim swept across the desert just 170 years ago with his hordes of faithful, Fatima's ancestors saw the writing on the wall. Unable to get passage on a ship to Tel Akbir, they sold their interests in Thyatis and promptly accepted a life of the eternal truth, declaring to the local scholars that they would live by the articles of faith. Through the line from that time to the birth of Fatima, the family has experienced many twists and turns, eventually resulting in Fatima's great-grandfather becoming an indebted slave to an Alassian nomad member of the Dayan tribe. Once his debt had been paid off, he was given the choice of leaving under his own steam or joining the tribe as an equal. Fatima's great-grandfather looked out into the bleak, unwelcome desert and saw only death, and promptly took the hand of his former owner, promising his life and the life of his progeny to the Dayan tribe for all eternity. Fatima was born 22 years ago, slightly shorter than her Alassian compatriots and obviously paler. They make fun of her Thiatian features every now and again, but it is all good-natured, and she gives as good as she gets, laughing about their differences. Fatima has a real fetish for jewellery though, especially rings, and she prefers to wear her wealth than keep it in her pocket, earning her the name of Goldfingers. 
Fatima comes across as strong and confident, but if you know her well, you'd know there's an anxiety deep within her about her wish to be a better rider, which manifests as her occasionally chewing her lip in frustration. All in all, Fatima bint Ismail is a valued member of her tribe, which causes her more anxiety as she contemplates a growing wanderlust and a road to adventure. And more rings. I love it. From just a couple of pages of information, we have created Fatima bint Ismail, and now I really want to play this character. Perhaps she is just now staring at those Nithian highlands, wondering if she'll be missed if she ventures out beyond her tribe's campfires and into the night to see what's there. I think if I have one criticism of the Illery character generation, it would be that it would have benefited from some random tables. I know I did it myself, but having it already done for me and presented in a user-friendly format would have been the icing on the cake, and sped things up a bit. Okay, so let's leave behind Fatima bint Ismail on her adventures, and now we'll explore a new character class presented in this player section. This is the Dervish class, or the Desert Druid, not to be confused by both the Dervish monster entry in the Expert Rules, or the actual Druid class in the Companion Rules. We are told that the Dervish is a special NPC Cleric class, so dervishes are clerics, but with the following differences. All dervishes have a constitution of 13 to 18. All dervishes share the same saving throws with dwarves, making them quite resistant to magic. Dervishes tend to use no weapons or armour, although they can use them if forced to. One confusing bit of information is that they fight as thieves of a similar level, which I take to mean they use the thief attack roll table, but this is the same as the clerics anyway, so I'm not sure about the distinction. If you have an idea, please comment. Dervishes can turn undead as a cleric. And dervishes have a mix of clerical, druidic and special spells which are adapted to life in the desert. Finally, the spell lists for dervishes are considerably smaller than for a cleric, with only 5 spells available per level. When I first read this, I was tempted to consider the dervish class as a player character choice. However, after more consideration, I think a player would be severely restricted. Apart from the lack of spells and weapons, they probably wouldn't be inclined to leave the desert and adventure beyond its borders, which is something that is likely to happen in a lengthy campaign. No, I think the dervish is a wonderful bit of flavour to add to scenarios taking place in the desolate wastes of the Alassian Basin, especially for low-level characters wanting to hear the words of a strange wise man, known to live in a cave way off over somewhere. I don't know why, but I keep picturing Spike Milligan in the life of Brian when I think of this. Anyway, the player section ends with some useful information on courteous behaviour in accordance with custom, including customary greetings, and we are provided with a useful glossary of terms, just in case the introduction of all these customers and strange sounding names has put your head in a spin. Tucked away right at the end of this section is a list called the Hydra Months, which one would correctly suspect is the calendar of the Emirates. There's quite a few things to say about this. Firstly, it's a bit of a shame that the Illery calendar didn't get more prominence in this gazetteer, in the same way as it was in Gaz 1. Especially as one of the religious rituals we looked at earlier was fasting for 24 hours on the day of the full moon. Based on the information here, we wouldn't know when that was. Also, this calendar is a copy of the actual Islamic Hijra calendar, except that here it only consists of 11 of the 12 months, and is missing the month of Shaban between Rajab and Ramadan. Ironically, Shaban is the month of finding water, a major part of al kalims Articles of Faith in his dream of a garden in a desert. So probably not the one you wanted going missing. But clearly this was an editing error. This is another time when it becomes necessary to have access to Gaz 1 to make sense of Gaz 2. The calendar as described in the Grand Duchy of Galamecos has 12 months of 28 days each. A perfect lunar calendar, if you like detailing all the phases of the moon and offering probabilities of celestial events. Knowing this, we can apply the months of the Hydra calendar to this framework. I've done it for you here. And while we're at it, why don't we add the Arabic days of the week as well? Sure, it's all real-world information that is equivalent to using the Gregorian months and the days of the week Monday to Sunday, but any potential unfamiliarity with this calendar and the days of the week might be all the immersion you need. I hope some of you find it helpful. And so we come to the end of the player's pullout section, and we can move into what I call the final adventuring section. This begins with a 15-page chapter called The Village of Kirkuk. 
Now, I'm pretty certain that the name of Kirkuk was copied from the town of the same name in northern Iraq, especially as in the Gazetteer, its Qadi is named Raman al-Saddam, which is perhaps a satirical nod to the then Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. If not, it would have been an extraordinary coincidence. Despite all this, we are told that the village of Kirkuk may be located anywhere in the Emirates, depending on where the dungeon master wants to place it. Within this section we are given 24 detailed village locations, which includes NPCs and adventure hooks. There is also plenty of atmospheric flavour for the DM to use, for when the characters are out and about in the village, such as suggestions for what might be going on around them, and the groups of beggars that are about the place. We are given more in-depth information on 20 specific NPCs, separated into allies, neutrals and villains. This detail touches on what motivates each of them, and their potential interdependencies with other NPCs or locations. The only thing lacking here are some decent stat blocks. We're given some information on class and level, but not much more. Sure, some DMs might enjoy generating all these NPCs themselves, but in my opinion, there should at least have been some stat blocks made available. Still, the detail we do have does stimulate the imagination, and actually, a stat block is not always needed when the interaction is mostly social. There is a particular section within this chapter that focuses on Alassian steeds. We are told that Alassian steeds are the swiftest horses in the world, but also they are the most inbred and delicate, and therefore prone to disabling injuries. We are given rules on how to determine the quality of a steed, and its potential to have a defect, and the character's ability to spot this information at the time of purchase is affected by their rider rating. I think this is a really good touch and brings into focus the Alassian love of horses and horse breeding. You could even have characters travel to the Emirates just to buy a horse. But they better make sure to find a friendly Illery with a high rider rating or they might not be able to spot any potential defects. In short, this could be a really effective piece of atmosphere to insert into any Illery community. The section on the village of Kirkuk concludes with 15 scenario suggestions for running adventures in and around the area. These are pitched at various levels, ensuring that progress through the levels is always a possibility. In my opinion, the 15 pages detailing the village of Kirkuk is an excellent setting that pulls on all the world building that led to this part of the book. In terms of its game design, I find it a little reminiscent of the Keep on the Borderlands. Not the adventure, but the actual keep, in that it is a safe haven in an environment filled with opportunistic adventure. Characters can set off on quests and return for rest and recuperation, or indeed they may find adventure right under their noses if they are astute enough. In addition, Kirkuk could clearly be replicated all over the Emirates, in lieu of greater detail of the country's cities not being given in earlier chapters. Find yourself having to deal with the characters exploring the coastal town of Jabur? Add a harbour and some seagulls, a bit more hustle and bustle and change some of the names. Visiting the great city of Ilarum? Expand it again, but add great centres of learning, such as the Desert Garden University and the Palace of the Caliph, as presented on the inside of the Gazetteer's cover. They're not mentioned anywhere else in the book, so why not use them this way? And whilst I'm on the subject of these two buildings, it's worth me giving them the same treatment as when discussing the maps of the Tavern and Manor House in Gaz 1. Although not particularly sophisticated maps, they give us an idea of what Illery architecture is like, with their gardens, towers and outdoor spaces. This can help a DM conceive ideas for their own Illery constructions, and only adds to the tools the Dungeon Master has available in helping immerse players in a culture and environment that may otherwise be alien to them. The final chapter of this gazetteer is called Campaigning in Ilarum, which offers support for both new and experienced Dungeon Masters wanting to understand how to frame this setting against the information that came earlier in the book. There are suggestions for potential bad guys in building up a campaign that expands beyond the dungeon to political intrigue, to an ultimate evil power trying to undermine everything. The choice is the DMs, and there's plenty of suggestions here to grab hold of. One thing that does become clear here is why we had that underground map on the inside cover. I'd love to say more on that, but you might be playing rather than running the game, so I'll skirt the subject for now. What I will say is that it supports an intriguing campaign idea that could take characters from first level all the way up to 36th, and my mind is just buzzing with the potential for adding some Nithian intrigue to that. God, I wish I had more time. After a few pages of suggested monsters for the region, 
we are offered an intriguing mechanic called Legend Lore that capitalizes on gaining rumors from storytellers about the location of certain magical items. It works by rolling a D percentile and then adding the storyteller rating of the person being asked. The result is modified depending on the power of the item, broken down into whether it is appropriate for basic, expert, companion, or master level play. The result determines what the storyteller knows from absolutely nothing to intimate detail of the item and its history. This is a fantastic addition to the rumor mill that may exist in any campaign. I can picture the characters entering a ragged tent and giving salam to an ancient, wizened, blind storyteller seeking the location of the gold seal ring of Al Kalim. He chuckles at their optimism, listening to how far they have travelled to speak with him to learn of this ring's location. The old man leans towards the characters, his face a picture of consternation and concentration, before he farts loudly and bursts out laughing at them, believing they could find such a thing. His laughter rings in their ears as they leave the tent red-faced, not least because of the smell that won't leave their nostrils. This chapter concludes with eight suggestions for adventures throughout the Emirates, pitched at a mixture of levels. However, there is also a ninth adventure called the Pilgrimage of al Kalim which offers true believers the opportunity to follow in the exact footsteps of Suleiman al Khalim on his search to petition an immortal. Set for characters from basic to master level, who knows where this might actually lead and what rewards might actually be won. And so we come to the end of Gaz 2, the Emirates of Ilarum, and I have to say, my initial negative first impressions have been silenced. In this book, we have been given a cohesive backdrop to living and adventuring in the Emirates of Ilarum. We have a framework on how society works and why. We have geography that is hostile, but tamed by those who know the eternal truth. We have a detailed setting in the form of the village of Kirkuk that may be duplicated or built on for adventuring anywhere in the Emirates. And we have a system of personalizing your character so that they may be Ilari and belong to this way of life. The book is not perfect though, and as I mentioned earlier, the A1 map has its mistakes. And as I read through the text, there were more than too many editing errors, ranging from simple spelling mistakes to incorrect references to the core Beckme rules. I mean, it left out an entire month in the calendar. I'm not sure why this was the case compared to Gaz 1. Perhaps it was publishing pressures. Both were released in the same year after all. However, it is a shame when the subject matter and objective of the Gazetteer was so interesting and engaging. If I have one more lingering issue about Gaz 2, it is that the Arabic names and tribes etc. are direct lifts from the real world. And whilst I think this might be easy enough to get past, I'm not sure this would be the case for players of Arab descent seeking immersion beyond just seeing a list of names that are used every day. As I mentioned earlier, it would be great to get the views of these players if they can be shared. Despite all this, I think I've been converted to the eternal truth. Gaz 2, the Emirates of Ilarum, is an excellent campaign setting that would lend any campaign world a well thought out desert civilization backdrop, even if you just took the bits you liked and left the bits you didn't. There's much to adore here. Well, I really enjoyed my journey through the Emirates. I have an oasis of ideas springing out from between my ears, and not enough time to play them all. Thank you for sticking around with me till the end. Please like and subscribe if you think I deserve your future attention as I continue my trip through the Gazetteers. If you enjoyed this video and wish to support my channel further, then please consider buying me a coffee. Link on the screen and in the description. Otherwise, I'm Beckme Berserker. Keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.